it always goes back to that. I'm sure people, the listeners heard it. You're the average of the five people you hang out with. I just think that's so very true. And so if you don't have those five positive people, and what I realize later is they don't need to be people. And what I mean is you can find those things in books. You can find those people in books, in history. Those could be their mentors. Those could be your best friends. Those could be the people on the podcast can be it. And so I realized that later on. So going into, you know, law school, um, finding those those two kids, they're actually both judges now in their respective states, but finding those two uh, students, I knew that was going to be a positive impact. And obviously it, it turned out to be. Welcome to the Audio Life Podcast, where we tell your story in your voice. We're your hosts today, Gafour Masood. And Carrie Purcell. And today we get to have a conversation I'm really looking forward to. Our guest has recently published his memoir. It's called Wandering Spark. It was published by Town Bee Press. And throughout his story, he talks about pushing the limits of what's possible as an athlete, an ultra marathon runner, a lawyer, an entrepreneur, and a business owner. But not before overcoming a lot of conflict and turmoil in his younger years, including multiple arrests, going to rehab, and the real potential that he wouldn't graduate high school. It's an incredible story of finding the drive or or the spark to continue and um, beat the seemingly impossible when no one thought he could, and also his search for belonging. So today we have Kyle Robinson joining us to share his story. Kyle, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us. No, I appreciate both of you guys having me. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Kafour. I'm looking forward to it today. Awesome. Awesome. Now, Kyle, we often like to start at the very beginning, and maybe we'll uncover some details that you haven't yet shared in the book, but can you please start by telling us where you were born, and is there a story behind your name? So, actually, there is a story behind my name. So, for, I was born in um, right outside Chicago, Arlington Heights, a suburb of Chicago, in 1978. What a year. And so... Um, the story behind my name is my mother and my father were in the hospital and my father was leafing through some sort of magazine or something about there. And there was an article in there about Clint Eastwood and Clint Eastwood's son's name is Kyle. And they really liked that name. And actually back in like 1978, it was kind of rare to have the name Kyle. And so they named me Kyle and that's, it's not, not a family name or anything like that, but that's where they have. And I don't, I don't, I don't think they're really big fans of Clint Eastwood or they don't hate him or don't like him, but they just <laughs> like the name. And so that's how I was kind of named. That's how the name came up. Th- that was my next question, actually. Were they fans of Clint Eastwood? Um, uh, you, you, <laughs> you answered, are you a fan of Clint Eastwood? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love his movies. Uh, I think Unforgiven is probably one of my favorite uh, movies. So, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of, I wouldn't say big fan, but uh, no, I enjoy his movies, sure. Great stuff. Awesome. Okay. Well, we are going to talk more about your childhood, um, your education, some of those formative experiences that impacted your life and the direction it would take. But if I were to ask you at this point to share just one story with the world, which would it be and why? Well, one, uh, well, I, I spread just to choose one story, but the one story that I probably would have shared with the world, which I did put in the book, is how I was uh, applying for the bar exam. I almost didn't even apply to take the bar exam because I was so scared of my past and I thought it would just catch up to me. And so I wouldn't be where I was at today if I just didn't, because, uh, and we might get into it, I, I've been arrested multiple times and I was I did terrible in high school, did terrible in college. And so I was just so scared to A, take the bar exam and fail or take the bar exam and they wouldn't even let me in because of my past, you have to take this big character and fitness exam. So I was actually living in fear this whole time before I even took the bar exam and I just threw caution in the wind and just did it anyhow, faced the fear. And so my biggest story would, I wouldn't say my biggest story, but one of those biggest things is I was just so scared and the scared, the fear I built up in my head yeah. was just, I thought it was going to be the end of the world if I did this and I just faced it and I did it. And if I wouldn't have faced that fear and did that, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. So that's one of the biggest things that I can look at that I actually did that I almost did not do and almost talked myself out of. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you know, you you put it in the title of your book, you talk about it throughout the book that you do have this 
drive within you somehow to do these things, even when you maybe you don't believe in yourself or others don't believe in you. And you just, you know, you you also talk in the book about how the fear at that time of your life was almost debilitating. It was it was physically manifesting um, as panic attacks as well. So how do you get yourself to do it? Where did it come from that you actually pushed yourself forward anyway? That's a great question. I, I I don't know if that comes from anywhere. Like, I think when I was younger, I was just trying to push myself because I want to prove to everybody that I could, yeah. you know, be something or do something. So it wasn't about myself or like, but I always, there's something I was born with. I, I don't know. I, maybe everybody is, but I just always knew inside me that I was going to do something that I like, it didn't matter to me. It didn't matter what was happening around me or something. So it was always inside me. And, you know, sometimes I wouldn't listen to that calling or so to speak, but I always believed in myself. I had this always, and sometimes I buried it down and didn't cultivate it at all, but Mm -hmm. it was always there, like pushing me forward. And sometimes to be honest with you, sometimes it's annoying because sometimes I just want to just let go and just not try so hard or just not do anything, but it's always there pushing me and say, Hey, you can do better. You can be more, you can do this. And so it's always, and it's never left me and it's always it's in there right now one of the reasons why i wrote the book as well wonderful thank you um kyle for those listening who haven't read your book yet tell us about your childhood what life was like growing up sure so i'll just tell you about my first memory when i so it was around four years old so my mom got a divorce from my dad and we moved back fr- from Chicago and we moved back to Ohio when I was only four years old. So it was me at four years old, my older brother at six years old and my younger sister at three years old. And my mom was around 32. And one afternoon, um, I'm upstairs playing with like my He-Man action figures or something like that. And I hear the doorbell ring and I got really excited because this normally doesn't happen in my house. And so I rushed downstairs and as I get to the bottom of the stairs, I'm greeted by this six foot three tall man with like a big brown beard and like bifocal glasses. And I'm just stunned. And my mom who answered the door went and like, went and grabbed something from the kitchen. And so it's just me and this intimidating figure looking at each other. And I greet him as, you know, any four year old might greet him. I just make a fist and I just punch him in the leg and giggle. And what this man did was he made a fist too. And he punched little four year old Kyle right in the stomach back. And I keeled over and I couldn't scream out because I couldn't breathe and like tears were running down my face. And he didn't like try to comfort me, didn't look at me, just walked around me and just went into the kitchen and I just scampered upstairs. And that was my first memory and my first meeting with somebody who eventually become my stepfather, uh, Ben, or as my sister and I later call him, Triple B, Big Bad Ben. That's kind of was how my life went from four years old until like after high school. And so that was my first memory of growing up and it just kind of got worse from there. Yeah. You were very impressionable at that young age. And for that to be your first right. impression of somebody, you know, it's it, it has a lasting effect. And we see as it develops in the book, you know, how that relationship develops and how you kind of overcome that within yourself, because that must have been something very, very difficult to do. Well, and what made it more difficult and people want to ask and like, what about your mom? Didn't your mom do anything about this? And I love my mom so very much. Like, mm-hmm. but the thing about my mom, she just wanted a father for us so bad. Yeah. She was rationalizing like, you know, boys will be boys. This is OK. And so she would make excuses, make, you know, pretend. And she didn't want to have another failed marriage on her hand either. Mm-hmm. And she just needed a. She thought it was very important, you know, for a financial reason and for to raise us to have a father. And what made it worse was she would make us call him dad and like tell us that we loved him. And so growing up, I thought this is what love was. Mm-hmm. I thought this is what a father was supposed to be like. And it really it really took a toll on me. And I didn't realize until later, like w- what a male role model was supposed to be like. I was just so afraid of men until I met one. I was like stunned, like, oh, you know, somebody was like nice to me. Somebody pushed me, you know, or, you know pushed me to do better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was, it was really an amazing experience. Mm-hmm. Were there times, I mean, you do talk in the book a lot about your formative years, um, some difficult and, and, and unhealthy relationships. Were there, sure. were there times in your, in your childhood that were fond memories or even funny, funny moments, maybe with your siblings or outside of the home? Sure. So I loved hanging out with my, my grandmother, my mm-hmm. mom's mom, which I had a lot of, you know, a lot of fun with. And also growing up, I played, you know, sports. I loved playing baseball and hanging out with my friends and things like that. So those were nice escapes. So I didn't have a terrible child, like, yeah. I was just always in fear of going home or being around that. So like, and as a little kid that really 
brings you down. But no, I enjoyed a lot of things. Uh, you know, like I said, playing baseball, hanging out with my brother and my sister, exploring and things like that. But it's somewhat difficult too because, you know, not only my whole life wasn't that great, but my mom, who married my stepdad, he joined the Navy, and so we were moving around a lot. So I lived in like, you know, from Ohio to Newport, Rhode Island to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, all over the place. Well, actually, it was Philadelphia and then Newport, Rhode Island, and then back to Ohio. So it was like hard to meet friends, you yeah. know, and you're always starting over new. So, but I did enjoy a lot of my, you know, sports and hanging out with my brother and sister. So those were enjoyable, fun times and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. So, so Kyle, you, you had quite an interesting relationship with school and academia. Can you explore that a little bit? Tell us what your experience was like, you know, in high school college, law school, but let's take it from the start, you know, in, in early school years. How was that? Sure. So um, early school years, I went to, you know, Catholic school. That's only, or, you know, that's because when uh, we moved out to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, the school systems there were just absolutely terrible. So my mom put me and my brother and my sister into Catholic school. And so we went there for a while. And then once we moved back to Ohio, it was in seventh or eighth grade, we went to the public school system, but also as I was getting older um, and to deal with, you know, my stepfather, uh, I started to rebel out a lot, especially in high school. I started to, you know, hang out with the wrong friends. I started to get in fights a lot because I was just, you know, knowing what I know now, I was just screaming out for help. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know how to deal with my home life. And so my grades started plummeting in high school. And I started getting involved with drugs a lot. So I was getting high at school. I was getting drunk at school and I started to get suspended. I started to get expelled a lot. And I didn't know what to do about it because I knew, like I, I said before, I had a little spark inside me. I knew I was smart. I, some, uh, I knew that I was capable of doing more. I just didn't know how. And so I wanted to take control of this. So what I decided to do after I got expelled one time and I went back to school and just still got in more trouble, I decided just to leave school one day and turn myself into drug rehab because I wanted this mm. madness to stop because I couldn't understand why all my friends were doing the same things I was doing you know, getting drunk, getting high, or just partying, but they weren't getting suspended. They weren't getting invites. I didn't realize at the time that they didn't have the home life I had. And so I was like reacting differently. And so I went and turned myself into drug rehab and that took me back an, another year in high school. So eventually when I came back to high school, my sixth year, I was a six year senior. Um, I eventually graduated high school. I think my class rank was 346 out of 349. I had a graduate with a 1.046 GPA. And so that was my, uh, col that was my high school life. And so when I graduated high school, college was not on my mind whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's more story. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happened in high school that brought me to where I'm at today, but that's kind of my academic, so to speak. I just did not do very well in uh, high school whatsoever. And it frustrated me as a kid because I knew I was smarter. I just didn't, not that I didn't care. I just, I was just lost. When you're a kid, you don't know what's going on. And I didn't know, I just didn't know how to deal with what was going on in my life. So yeah. I did what I could. Yeah. Especially when you know that you're capable, but perhaps the environment was not conducive for it. And, you know, um, you mentioned a little bit in your book, but you know, maybe goofing off and getting high and all of that stuff, it, it plays a part and it. It's, it's really a whirlwind at that age as well to keep focused. Um, however, that didn't stop you. Although you, you had some struggles and some frustration in high school, that didn't stop you from continuing your education. As I understood, you went on and proceeded with law school. That, yep, that's right. So I guess, uh, there's two things that happened to me in high school on why I pushed myself forward. So uh, things were going really bad for me, obviously. And then once I started my sixth year of high school, after I did drug, drug rehab, I got expelled one year and then I went to drug rehab one year. So that put me back two years. On so my sixth year of high school, when I went back, two things happened. One is they just kind of stuck me in in-school suspension. And in-school in school suspension in high school is where they sit you in a room, you can't talk, you can't sleep, they bring you your assignments. You're allowed to leave two times during the day to a chaperone bathroom break. And it was good for me because it kept me out of trouble and I wasn't able to hang out with my so-called friends and doing these things that I was doing before. But also a great thing in there was the in-school suspension teacher named Mr. Brady. The only time you were allowed to talk was to talk with him. And so I, st I talked with him a lot about my schoolwork and things like that. And this Mr. Brady was one of the first male role models that told me, hey, 
you're smart. You can be something. You can do something with your life. Like, and he believed in me. And this is the first time that a male role model actually believed in me and told me that I could do something with like, and I was blown away. And not that I did something at that moment to do something about it, but a seed was planted at that moment that, hey, I can do something. I can believe in myself. And I, if I do try, I can do something. And so I always remember that whenever I going forward in my life, um, when I was trying to difficult things, it was, it was just amazing to have somebody believe in me at that time when things were not, when any person on the outside could see that I was not, there was nothing to believe in really. So it, it was nice to have that. And then the second amazing thing that happened when I wasn't in, in school suspension, I was you know, going to classes and one day I was making fun of some kid outside of school. And uh, I guess I was making fun of him to the wrong person because this person told him that I was making fun of him. And this time I'm 18 or 19 years old and I can't get in any more trouble because if I get arrested this time, I'm going to be facing serious, yeah. serious like jail time. Like, so the big boy, you know, it's, and I do not want to get in any more trouble. And so I'm trying to stay on the straight and narrow because I just want to graduate high school. I was just trying to keep my head down, but my mouth got the best of me. I started making fun of somebody to the wrong person. So this kid heard about it. So after school one day, I'm walking outside of class and this kid is looking for me out, out in the parking lot and screaming my name to everybody. And I was like, oh no. And so I'm trying to get, you know, get away, but everybody knows who I am. And they start pointing me out. And before I know it, this kid's trying to fight me. And this kid could definitely beat me up. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not very tough kid. I just, you know, tried to sound tough, but uh, I was trying to run away from this kid because I do not want to get in any trouble. And before I know it, there's a big group of like about a hundred kids standing around us, you know, screaming, fight, 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 you know, how kids are. And I'm just trying to run away from this kid, run around the circle. And, you know, no punches were still thrown. But before I know it, a cop comes in, arrests me and this other kid. And I'm charged with assault, disorderly conduct, disturbing peace, everything like that. And I'm like, and I didn't even do anything wrong. And so, and, I, and I'm going to be in big trouble if I get convicted of this. And so my mom, who's got me lawyers in the past when I was a kid, would not get a lawyer for me this time because, A, she, she didn't really believe me that I didn't do anything, mm. and even though I'm telling her I didn't, because I, I didn't get anybody a reason to. And also, you know, it's not like she can just shell out all kinds of money all the time for uh, these attorneys. So I have to go to court. And so I know in my heart that I didn't do anything wrong. So I said, forget it. So I'm just going to defend myself in court. And so that's exactly what I did. I went to court and remember, I'm still a high school kid, even though I'm, you know, 18 or 19 years, years old. So I go to court one day. And, you know, there's the prosecutor, there's me, there's the judge, and there's a bailiff. And the prosecutor calls the first witness, who is this police officer. And he starts asking him, do you see the person who's involved in this altercation? And the police officer, you know, points me out, you know, asks a couple more questions. Then it's my turn. The judge goes, would you like to ask some questions? And I'm thinking, yeah, of course I want to ask some questions. So as a, you know, a scared teenager, I start asking the police officer questions, you know, stuttering. I'm sure my voice was shaking, but I started asking the police officer, you know, where were you when you first saw this altercation? And he said, oh, I was about 75, 100 yards away. I go, okay. And what were you doing? And he said, oh, I was sitting in my police cruiser. I was like, all right. And then he goes, well, then I asked, well, how many kids did you see around us, around the fight? And he said, oh, there's about a hundred kids. And I said to the officers, I said, so you're telling me from a hundred yards away, sitting in your police cruiser through a hundred kids, you saw me actually physically assault somebody. And he goes, well, no, I can't say a hundred percent for sure. And then that was it. I was found, you know, not guilty. Case was dismissed. And I was just so happy. And I was just like, wow, Mr. Brady was right. If I do believe in myself and I, if I do try, you know, things will go well. And so, and that was, and also that was another seed was planted in me. You know what? I, I am smart. I can do this. I can, you know, be part of this system, you know, if I, you know, apply myself. And so that was just another seed that was planted to me. I was like, and at that moment I thought, you know, maybe I do want to be a lawyer, but I didn't really pursue it because I didn't think I could, because I was barely graduated in high school and things like that. So that's one of the two things that happened to me while I was in high school that I thought I could do more. And so I eventually graduated uh, high school, not doing great. And, um, and so I didn't have a lot of prospects. You know, most people, when they're you know going on to college and things like that, they're taking the SATs, the ACT. I didn't take any of yeah. that. You know what I mean? Because I was too busy getting in trouble or just trying to trying to survive. And so right after high school, I got a job at an oil change place, which, and truth be told, I don't know anything about cars. And so beware if you ever go to this one of the cookie loop places, there are people like me who <laughs> know nothing about cars. I was changing oil. But... <laughs> but <laughs> Not that I best think it, but it's it's not that difficult. But I'm just uh, <laughs> anyhow. So I was changing oil right after high school, and I just kept 
you know, I was under, you know, working under a car one day, I was like, this is not what I want to do with my life. And so what I decided to do is take the ACT. And so I took the ACT and I got into college, like uh, I got the University of Akron, which, I mean, truth be told, there, you know, it's, it's not very difficult to get in. It wasn't at the time, but I got in and I was like, wow, I have a chance. I have an opportunity. So I'm going to really, I'm really going to focus on this. So what I did, I, st- you know, I stopped drinking I stopped getting high. I said, I'm just going to focus on this. And so what I did is I studied my ass off my first semester of college. And I made the Dean's list. I almost got a 4.0 my first semester of college. And that's after, you know, you know, six years of high school, 1.046 mm-hmm. GPA. And I made the Dean's list my first semester of college. I was blown away. And I was like, yo, I knew I could do it. And so once I made the Dean's list, I said, you know what? I'm going to transfer schools. I want to go to a better school. And so I transferred to Kent State University. But when I got to Kent State University, I had a whole new group of friends. They weren't bad guys, but they were, you know, they were partiers. So I kind of fell into that, that whole group again. I started partying a lot again. My grades started to... Uh, have a big impact as well. And so I almost got kicked out of Kent State because I was doing so bad. And then one day we decided to do some day drinking. So I decided to drive down to the bars one day and we were there's something called power hour. We have to drink so many drinks every hour or something like that. And, but anyhow, we were doing that one afternoon and we got pretty drunk. And so what we decided to do, you know, we, let's go back to our house, our college house. Let's change and go back to the bars. And I said, okay, everyone hop into my Jeep. Let's go. And so as we're driving back to the house, I decide, you know, there's, you have to take a left-hand turn to get onto our street. And as I'm taking this left-hand turn, I accelerate on the grass and I, or on the gas and I hit the telephone pole, total my Jeep, put everybody in the hospital. Cops are called. I get a DUI. I'm arrested again. I have to spend time in this, uh, you know, this intervention course, and I was like, oh, here we go again. This is like my life, you know, going downhill again, you know, just like high school, like, what am I doing? And so that happened and I, and that was right at the end of college. And so right after that happened, I really didn't change much, but I barely graduated college. I got like a 2.02 GPA and I'm done with college. And I think that, you know, obviously law school's not on the horizon as well. I'm, you know, I'm still kind of getting arrested. I was like, same old Kyle, same old story. Nothing's changing. I was like, so now I'm done with college. I want to run away. And so I thought if I, you know, got away from all these things, that things would get better. So what I, so what I happened to do is I just, I had a friend who lived out in California and I moved out to San Francisco, California, um, right after college and lived out there. And that was actually a nice little break because I was away from a lot of my friends. I was able to focus a lot and I was just bartending out in California. I was like, oh, this is nice. But I was like, I wanted more out of life than just being a bartender. I was like, I'm a college graduate. And then I thought about Mr. Brady. I thought about, you know, that time when I represented myself in high school. I was like, you know what? I could be a lawyer. I could do this. And so, you know, I stopped drinking again. I stopped smoking weed again. And I just studied to take the LSAT. That's the uh, test you have to take to get into, uh, law school and truth be told, I didn't do so well the first time. And so I took it again. And so I was not going to give up on this. And so I, I did well enough to actually get inside, get into a school. I got into Western Michigan Cooley Law School. It's an accredited law school. I was like, wow, I, I have this opportunity. And so I moved from San Francisco, California, all the way to Michigan in Lansing, Michigan. And I knew I had this great opportunity. And so what I decided to do, I'm not going to mess this one up. And so in law school, I grabbed the two smartest people that I could find. Hmm. And it's not very difficult to find the two smartest people in law school because they're always raising their hand. They're always talking. And I just gravitated towards them. And I'm not joking. And I just hung out with them all three years. And law school, it's very, law school is no joke. You actually have to study every day. You have to take it serious. It's not like, you know, I obviously I graduated high school and college, but you kind of limp through that and kind of get through that. But law school is no joke. If you do not study and you don't do it, they will kick you right out. Hmm. And so, I just hung out with those guys. And so I did fairly well in law school. I made the Dean's List one semester. I got a certificate of merit one semester, and that's getting the highest grade in one of your classes and pretrial skills. And and so I took law school very seriously. And eventually, and to, in order to graduate law school, you have to t- take an internship. So I just applied to internships in New York City, and I got one in New York City, and I just moved out to New York City. And so that puts me out in New York City and granted, uh, I'm still going through law school, but as I said earlier in the podcast, I still have to pass the bar exam if I want to be an attorney. And that's a, they have to do a big background check. They have to take, you know, an FBI fingerprints and everything like that. So I I still wasn't uh, there yet because I was always living in fear this whole time that I'd have to do that. So I was like, I'm kind of just going through this motions in law school. Like, I'm not going to be able to become a lawyer. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not the... uh, 
Oh, well, I'll jump in. So, um, so there were a few things that stood out in that, you know, in that in that journey. Um, one of them was the the influences that you've had uh, in your peer group, and and how much that impacted your ability to focus and succeed, and and what you spent your time on. And it sounds like in law school, you really shifted um, the people around you, and that made a big impact on what you were able to accomplish. Uh, you know, one of the reasons um, that you that you've shared that you you maybe didn't believe in yourself, or you looked for distraction, or you looked for um, you know something to um, you know maybe even ease the pain that you were feeling at home, was because of this this figure that you had at home uh, who you called Triple B, uh, who you and your sister called Triple B, um, and that he told you as you were growing up that you 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 weren't going to amount to anything and that was you know despite that spark inside of you saying no I, I don't think it's true I think there's something here um, you carried that with you uh, and when you actually graduated law school he did he did give you what would be a backhanded compliment right he did say that was quite an accomplishment um, and then followed it with I would have lost a bet I mean how did how did that was it gratifying how did it feel to hear that was it what was it like it's, it was no surprise coming from him, to be honest with you, but also in the back of my head, you know, I kind of did it just to prove to him and to everybody else that I could do it. And I thought, you know, th these people would be jumping for joy. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was just like, wow, you did it. But nothing like that happens. You know what I mean? Even so, you know, a lesson is life. Like if you're doing everything for somebody else, it's not going to be worth it. You got to do it for yourself. And so I kind of thought that that's what would happen or like maybe our relationship would change. Maybe I would like, maybe I wouldn't be a loser in his, yeah. in his mind, but it's, it didn't matter. It didn't, I could have done, it could have been so many things. It, it didn't matter what I was going to do in life. But to him, I was not going to, you know, meet his standards. Not that it, I think his standards are that great, but like in his head, yeah. it, it wouldn't have mattered. So it wasn't really disheartening, but it was just, it was just par for the course at that time. You know what I mean? And yeah. also thinking about it now. And so I, I'm not sure he could have hurt me or, you know, I was very proud of myself at that moment. So yeah. it didn't, he wasn't going to bring me down as he had my whole life. So I was doing that despite him, but also, yes, there was part of me trying to prove him wrong. But again, it, it didn't matter to him. Yeah, I, and I think that's, a, you know, I don't know at what point in your life you realize that, but that is sort of an acceptance and a maturity that you have to come to for, for you to be able to fulfill yourself and not, um, you know, despite being able to find motivation in trying to prove somebody wrong or that, that kind of underdog story, um, you're not going to change him and uh, you can change your, your path in life and the way that you perceive things. And it sounds like, uh, if not at that point, but it sounds like maybe at that point you were already there as well. Right. I was getting there, you know, yeah. it's just, I, I've been through a lot and I just realized it, once you're like around positive people that are pushing you to do better and be better, your whole world changes and your whole world, you know, you don't have to sit like, Oh, you know, this is my life. This is, you know, I just thought, well, you know, I thought people like, I really thought like everybody was like triple B. I thought all adults were and yeah. like, and, and I'm not joking when I say that. I really thought every single man like yeah. I met was like that. I thought they're all miserable, hated life, or just mean people. Once you met people that weren't like that, like my whole world changed. And then I just gravitated towards these people that wanted me to do better and be better. And it just it's just an amazing feeling. And so when you're a kid and you're just stuck in there, just thinking, wow, this is the, world, the way the world is, it's, it's crazy yeah. when you realize it's not. Yeah. So, Kyle, there was a lot of repeated patterns there because of those, you know, belief systems and you call them seeds, you know, seeds of empowerment that really shifted that, you know, sense of what you can accomplish and, you know, people giving you that motivation and encouraging you. And you had this real roller coaster of a ride um, all across um, your, your your academic life. And you, you mentioned then, you know, your first job or one of your first jobs working in a in an auto garage uh, changing oil and so on and that wasn't your calling and and uh, and honestly revealed so but perhaps you could walk us through some of the highlights of your career so i i passed the bar exam and there's a whole story behind that but once i do i i said okay now i can get like a real job or whatever it is but my experience with the internship was not that best i worked at a matrimonial law firm and i did not enjoy that so much i thought i'd really like the drama of it but i did not like it was actually the opposite and also these men were working like 70 80 hours a week and yeah they were making a lot of money but they were absolutely miserable and i was i was starting to be mature enough to like i do not i don't know think i want that life where like you're just not enjoying their life at all. And so I just applied to 
jobs where you do need to be an attorney, but maybe not practicing so much. And I got this job at this legal education company. And this is one of the, one of those other moments that I feel so lucky that this happened to me because the person who owned this legal education company, the CEO, became one of my good friends and mentors. And this was actually a huge turning point in my life. If I did not find this job, I don't know where I'd be at today. So this this man, I say this man, he's just a, a couple years older than me. He kind of took me under his wing. It's not that, that's not how it worked. He didn't say, hey, I want to be your mentor. It just, it kind of like naturally evolves that way. But this man, you know, believed in me and he told me like the books to read and like he really got me into reading and the, you know, the people to listen to and the positive influences and told me, you know, you can do great things. And, and I also think, you know, I thought to myself, well, this man's almost, you know, same age as me. If he can do it, then I can do it. And it really just, that was just a huge turning point in my life. He let me do like presentations for the company about like optimism, positivity, overcoming and things like that. And just cultivated my, my beliefs that I had before and just really, uh, that's where everything kind of took a change for the better, like where it just really my, it just really excelled from there of a uh, turning point. So that was one of the biggest things that happened to me. So his name's David, his name, I put Gary in the book, but his name's David and he's just, it was so helpful and beneficial. It's a huge turning point in my life that have another male role model. Not only that was somebody that same age as me doing the things that I want to do. And he had like a confidence that I craved and he took risks and he questioned things. And I was just like, I want to be like that. And I want to have what he has. You know, I want to have a company. I want to be happy. I want to have the money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I always, always want to, his biggest thing was like teaching is the best form of learning. He was always trying to learn. And so I just really took a deep dive into learning as much as I can about things I wanted to learn about. And then after I worked for him for a few years, I moved back to Ohio. And like I said before, I was like, you know what? He's, you know, not much smarter than me. Not that he's not smart, but I was like, you know, if he can do it, I can do it. And so that's when I started my own company and, it kind of took off from there. And so once I started my own company, it was, it was just, it was just crazy. So that was one of the biggest turning points in my career was just meeting him and going through that. And I know, I understand everybody's not so lucky to do that. So I don't know, you know, serendipity or to, to when somebody like that comes in your life, maybe it's just to, uh, try and recognize that. I mean, maybe that's the most difficult part of it, but you know, mm -hmm. I, I feel really, really lucky that that happened to me. So. And now for a word from our sponsors. Ready to share your stories and life philosophy? Or capture those of a parent or grandparent? Or maybe a corporate package is right for you to build connection across your workforce and add value to your clients. Visit audiolife.io today to learn more. Our listeners will get 10% off using discount code GIFT10 and order number Audio Life Podcast. Audio Life, where memories find their voice. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think it's recognition, right? You know, and especially it was uh, impactful because it was, you know, up here, uh, you, you could see, okay, I can, I could do this. Maybe I can achieve this. And I think that's a little different. It was a mentor, but somebody close and similar to your age, you say, well, this can actually happen. And yeah, I think, I think you, you were spot on there with, with, um, it's about being aware and recognizing that. So that was another pivotal, pivotal moment for you. That's fantastic. Yeah. And we're still friends today. I, I just texted him yesterday. So it, it's actually, I mean, it, it's great. So I keep in contact with him. I see him sometimes whenever I go up to New York City. So it's great. Well, I was just, I was just thinking through the, and I think Kyle, you used the words role model, right? That he, he kind of modeled out um, a life that you saw that you could have and that you wanted. And whether you were uh, aware of it growing up, you know, you, you, during your internship, you, you saw people modeling a life that you didn't want. You thought you wanted it, but they weren't happy. They were working all these hours and so on. Um, you had other people in your life who were negative role models and positive role models gave you the, the, um, the belief and the hope and potential that you could do more. Um, and some of these people were friends or became friends. I'm just curious, kind of broadly speaking, how friendships shaped your journey. Sure. So, well, Growing up, as you might, in, I didn't know what friends were supposed to be like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I just wanted to, I didn't know friends were supposed to lift you up. I didn't know friends were supposed to help you out. I didn't know friends were still, were supposed to be there when you were going through tough times mm -hmm. because the friends I had in like high school did not do any of that because I didn't, again, I didn't know what friends were supposed to be like. So I hung out with the, like, the kids who did not bring me up, like, you know, the kids were doing drugs and I'm not saying it's their fault. I'm take full responsibility, but like that does not help you when you're hanging out with those kinds of kids, yeah. it's just going to bring you down. And so these kids, you know, when I was younger and I kind of knew that they were not good for me, but I didn't, 
I didn't have enough. I didn't believe in myself enough when I was younger. So if I had, you know, weed or if I had beer or if I, you know, was able to get some money together, they'd want to hang out with me. But if I didn't have any of those things, they wouldn't want to hang out with me. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I realized, like, I don't think I want to be around like that. But, but when you're a kid and you're a teenager, you don't know any better or you can't do any. And it's better in my head. It was better to be with them than be a loner or be an outcast. I did not want to be a loner. I didn't want to be because I think in high school, you know, in my head, that's even worse off. You know, not having anybody at all, and I was just attaching to anybody who was who wanted to hang out with me. So, I knew these kids were bad. I knew they were like bad for me, but I just didn't have enough self-respect, or I did not believe in myself. And so, going forward, you know, into high school, into college, I knew that I wanted more. I wanted better friendships. And so, in college, the kids that I did hang out with, they they were they were good kids. They just weren't good for me at the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so it was just bad for me. And so they're all great kids. But then it's always goes back to that. I'm sure people, the listeners heard that you're the average of the five people you hang out with. And I mm. cannot express that's I I just think that's so freaking true. So very true. And so if you don't have those five positive people, and what I realize later is they don't need to be people. And what I mean is you can find those things in books. You can find those people in books, in history. Those could be their mentors. Those could mm. be your best friends. Those could be the people who are, the, the podcast can be it. And so I realized that later on. So going into, you know, law school, um, finding those, those two kids, they're actually both judges now in their respective States, but finding those two, uh, students, um, I knew that was going to be a positive impact. And obviously it, it turned out to be, cause they pushed me to do be, be better and, and do more. And then meeting David after, uh, mm one of my first jobs, I just knew. And so what I knew in my head, what I was looking for and what I wanted. And once I found it, I knew to hold on to it almost for dear life. You know what I mean? And then it's also easy to know people that are bringing you down or people that are not good for you. It's very easy to recognize that and get them out of your life or not even, you know, have those negative influences. And now as a, now as I'm older and, you know, have more confidence and more respect for myself, I think it's better to be by yourself than with negative people. Mm. And, you know, and if you have those listeners think, oh, I don't have those people around. I, like I said, you can find them in the books, in the library. You can find them on podcasts. You know, those are the mentors that, you know, I used for a long time as well when I didn't have David around or I didn't have my law school friends around anymore. Yeah. It's still who I use today. Yeah. That's really powerful advice, right? So just kind of leading into that question we were talking about, you know, is it serendipitous that this person showed up in your life? And and whether you knew it at the time or not, it's looking for those role models, right? It's looking for what is serving you in your life, what's helping you down a direction that you know is a path that's good for you, that's what you want, that's fulfilling your goals and values, or it's not. And then being able to recognize and take the action. And, you know, it's so important that we hear stories from all kinds of people in the world because those are the connections that those out there that are wandering that are lost are looking for Um, so it doesn't have to be somebody that you know personally it has to be somebody that's on a path that you want to be on that you know that you can learn from and that you know that you can follow that path or a similar path you know again you've been lucky that came into your life but you've also been looking for it you were able to define it you were able to recognize it you were able to search for it and then you it sounds like both in meetings in that job with David where he was giving you that opportunity to share some of those positive lessons some of those learnings that could really impact people as well as in your book and on this podcast you're now able to share that for people to be able to to look to uh, even if they haven't met you in person directly as well right thanks yeah yeah So Kyle, you know, you talk about your childhood and it being, you know, particularly tough at times and quite turbulent. And I'm really curious, you know, what role have children played in your life now? If you have your own or maybe those are your siblings or friends and what was your experience like raising them? So I don't have any children. So it's funny and I'm sure it's because of how I was raised. It wasn't a conscious choice. It's just never happened. Maybe not yet, but I do have, my sister has two nephews and my brother has, or my sister has two kids and my nephews and my brother has two kids and they're my nephews and I talk to them all the time. And so, yeah, I can't speak too intelligently about raising kids or anything like that because I don't have any, but uh, I do spend a lot of time with my nephews and I do talk to them. And so I don't have any nieces. So my brother and my sister just produce males for some reason. So I don't know. (laughs) It's like, but yeah. So, um, yeah, if I did ever have a child, um, obviously I would raise him the way, um, 
I'm talking about right now, just being about positivity and just believing in themselves. Uh, my brother, who uh, you know, obviously went through a lot of the same stuff I did. He's an amazing father, and kind of doing the opposite of the way we were raised. So I kind of take a key from him, and because he has two amazing kids himself. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say about that. You know, having uh, the absence of a positive male figure taught you what not to be. You know, it's kind of like an inverse effect, and it's it's lovely to see and. Sounds to me like you're a terrific uncle. You're encouraging and positive uh, male role model for for your nephews. So that's special to see because I could see it going the other way as well. You know, sometimes people see uh, say like a victims who are have been abused in childhood um, may relive those things as they get older. And I think it's incredible that you've taken that approach. Like, no, this is not what I want to be. In the example of your brother, you know, he sounds like a a terrific father and he he goes like the complete opposite of of how you guys were brought up um with with triple b so so that's lovely to see right and also it's also and i think you touched on it a little bit we kind of went the opposite of what happened to us with the inverse and you know and people say all the time you know we're so grateful that, that this happened to us and it's it's easy to say intellectually yeah you're so grateful but obviously you wish that this did not happen to you yeah whatever, you know, how you're raised, but it did, I can't change that. I can't control that. And so obviously this did happen to us. And so you have to use that to your best ability. And I think it takes a while, a lot of growing, you know, therapy, things like that to really be thankful, not thankful that it happened to you, but embrace it and do something about it. And that's what I'm trying to do with it. And so a lot of people say, no, I'm so grateful that this happened because I'm able to do this. I said that for a while and and I didn't believe it. You know what I mean? No one wants to be like, oh, I'm so happy this happened to me. You know, it's easy to say that, but actually to really feel it and then do something about it. I think that's the big thing about it. And so, yeah. um, yeah, so that was a big thing for me. It's just, obviously I am grateful the way my life is right now and what happened. I'm, I'm not grateful that it happened to me, but I'm accepting it and just trying to do the best with what happened to me. And just, cause I'm sure I'd be a completely different person if I wasn't raised the way I was raised. Right, you know? of course. But this is, this is the way it is. So, you know, whether it's your nephews uh, or other people in your life, or maybe people who are listening to us today, what advice do you have for younger generations? For younger generations? Yeah. <laughs> well, mom. well, first, the past does not predict your future. That's my number one thing is obviously your past does not predict your future. It's almost uh, obviously my story is is in, um, indicative of that. Also, it's about your friends. It's about the people you spend your time with. I think that's one of the most important things. Hmm. Make sure you're, you're hanging around the people that make you feel good about yourself you know if you don't feel good about yourself or they're putting you down obviously that's not who is for you so it's very important to hang around the, the right people and also to believe in yourself if you want to do something you go for it and so and just not giving up just keep pushing forward just keep going forward just keep going keep going because success is not going to be in a straight line obviously if you want to do something or you believe that you can do something just keep going because you're going to have failures but just keep pushing forward and keep going forward so that, those would be my advice for, you know, the future generations. Very valuable. Very useful. Um, I, even I take on that advice. But Kyle, you know, looking back, uh, you talk about what you advise the younger generations, but looking back, is there anything that you would do differently? Well, yeah, I mean, I was just, I would do... Every, yeah, not everything differently, but like, you know, looking back, we can't go, you know, I, I hesitate to, you know, to go there and just, you know, obviously I would, I would have chose not to take six years to graduate high school. I, I would have chose to like study. I would have chose to like do the best I could. So I would have chose to study. So to do well in high school and maybe get out of there within four years, you know what I mean? Just take myself not more seriously, but I would, I would chose not to get high and do drugs when I'm 14, 15 years old. I would have chose not to do that. So I would have chose to do the things that I think are just, uh, common sense that, you know, speaking right now. So, um, yeah, I would change a lot of those things. I don't know if I would change. And we just touched on this tour. I don't know if I would change the way I was raised because I wouldn't be here right now where I'm at right now and talking to you guys. That's for sure. I wouldn't have, you know, wrote my book. So 
I don't know if I would change anything. And so I don't like going there because we, we, we can't do it. We can't, we can't go back and change anything. So I don't know. I don't know if that's a healthy exercise, but it's a fun uh, fantasy to, to, to go over, but yeah, we have right. to just go from where we're at today. Absolutely. Well, so how maybe jumping on that point, um, and I have some ideas from what you've shared in the book, but I'll, you know, I'll try not to color your response. Um, how do you nurture your, your mental and emotional well-being today? Sure. So obviously I have to change my relationship with alcohol because every time, as you, I was told my story before, every time I was like drinking or getting high, things were not going well. Once I stopped, things started getting, you know, going pretty well. I'm not in a recovery program or anything like that. I just, you know, I, if I drink, I, I mean, I haven't drank it all this year. So if I do drink, it's pretty rare. And so you have to change your relationship with, uh, with alcohol. And then uh, obviously, as from what the story I've told, uh, it's very important that I needed to go to therapy. And I went to, uh, I go to IFS therapy, internal family systems therapy. I can't highlight that enough. And then I do a lot of journaling. I journal in the morning and I journal at night. And then I'm a big runner. Mm -hmm. And so I do a lot of running, ultra running. And so exercising and then hang around the right friends, reading the right books and reading the right podcast. So those are all the things I supplement everything with. And also I have a dog. I can't highlight having a dog, how important that is. Mm. And so those are the things that I would recommend a lot, but I can expand on any of those if you want. All right, it's a great list. And I, you know, from reading your book, um, at least the portion of your life that you share in the book, running and that that sort of exercise and, and pushing the limits and getting outside and meeting great people uh, sounds like a big part of your journey. And maybe that was, you know, maybe that was a point in time that was driving you to a, a certain place, but it sounds like it's still a part of your life today. Yeah. And also, so I, and I knew, yeah, oh yeah. So we're going to get into running too, but I just want to circle back with, you know, things that are healthy for you. I'd be out at the bars, you know, drinking with my friends and I knew I wanted more in my life. And it just got to a point where I just thought I'm a big, uh, I like reading about, you know, stoicism, Ryan Holiday, if anybody things like that. And I, just thought, and I was reading at that point and there's a, a quote from Epictetus who says, how long are you going to wait before you demand the best of yourself? Hmm. And that quote always lives in my mind. And I'm sitting there drinking a beer. I was like, this, is, this is not the best of myself. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? I'm, and so I just left that one day. I was like, I'm just going, I got to go all in. I got to stop with this. I, like, I'm not demanding the best for myself. I want the best for myself. And so I just focused on that. And so that was a big uh, turning point for me as well. And then with regards to my running friends, that was a, after I moved back from New York City, um, I knew I wanted to hang out with, you know, the good people, the positive people. So I just joined like a running group and I kind of just met these, you know, three or four great guys that we go and do these long, like trail runs, ultra marathons. And we take trips every year out West and, you know, do a bunch of, uh, trail running and you just get to know somebody pretty well by spending a lot of time on the trails with them. And so I have a good group of friends doing some trail running and being out in the woods too is good mental therapy. So. Yeah. And, and then you highlighted your dog. Um, so is, how long have you had a dog in your life? What, you know, what impact has that had? Oh, Booker. So he's, uh, he's seven. He just turned seven. So I've had him for seven years, Booker Brooks. He's a big golden doodle. He's a big goofball, 85 pounds. <laughs> and yeah. he's just, uh, it's nice to, it's nice to come home to somebody who's always very, very happy to see you. Mm -hmm. And Booker is just, he's always happy. So it's, you know, it's good to, and I always tell him, I was like, man, I want to be like you all the time. And he's like, <laughs> you know, and I just pretend what he says, like, yeah, just don't worry about anything. You know what I mean? I go, and then I, <laughs> anyhow, I have these conversations with my dog. He's like, yeah, of course it's easy for you not to worry about anything. You have all everything taken care of. It's just, just take it easy, you know, day by day. But anyhow, the comfort of having a dog and just being there for you, you know, I take him on runs, you know, and it's just, you know, I cuddle with him on the couch. It's just, it's nice to have something like that. And just to wake up to that base every morning, very excited to see you. So I can't highlight uh, how important dogs are. So, yeah. yeah. And maybe because I don't have the kids, I know you asked about that before. My dog is my kid right now. So <laughs> we talk about like, you know, the aggregate of the five people that you're, you're most around. I mean, mm -hmm. having a dog that's full of unconditional love, always positive, likes to exercise. Surely that has a good effect on, on you as, as a fellow dog lover myself. So, um, uh, I, I can definitely relate. And, uh, a golden doodle, I, I can, can completely understand why that's a, a a crazy combination, but a very playful and positive one as well. Kyle, you've had what some people might refer to as, you know, unfair treatment and maybe 
similar people in your circumstances may have harbored feelings of resentment or rage. And I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on forgiveness and reconciliation? That's a great question because forgiveness is pretty. People say it's easy, and I, it's easier for me to say than to feel it. But I do forgive, you know, my stepfather. I do forgive my mom for staying with him, and, and so. I think forgiveness is important because, and what they say, and it's something you have to work on. They say it's, you know, more for you than it is for them, but I don't want to hold any resentment because I know how carrying that in you just, it just wrecks your whole life because I don't want to carry that anger inside me because it just ruined how I am every day. And so I work on that all the time. You know, when I journal, I write, I was like, you know, I yeah. write down, I forgive you, mom. I love you. You know what I mean? And also I forgive myself. And so I don't want to hold on to that anger. I don't want to be angry at anybody. I want everyone to be happy all the time. But it's like I said, it's easier said than done. But the way I look at it is like, why do you, I want to hold on to that angry? Why do I want to have them have that kind of control over me? Like being angry at them. I don't want to be angry at them. I, you know, let it go. And also, so I can't control what they do or how they react. I can only control what I do and how I react. So it's easier. I do forgive them. And, you know, I say right now, and it's also forgive myself for being so hard on myself too. Just, I have to let that anger go, anger go. And it's, like I said, it's easier said than it is done, but you, you have to like, just repeat it. You have to believe in it. You just have to work on it. And so that's where I'm at forgiveness. Of course, I forgive everybody and I, I, I forgive, and you have to forgive yourself too that's like i have to forgive myself for all the mistakes i've made in my life t as well so i can't beat myself up either and then you forgive yourself and you forgive everybody else and like i said it's a process it's just just because you say it, you're not gonna feel like oh it's great you know what i mean but just, it's just don't hold on to that anger because i don't want that inside me because i think it just grows when do you yeah. think that started that process um happened kyle was that something early on or is that something later in your adult years you said look i need to work through this um, it, it wasn't until later. I, so it's funny you say that. So after and I write about this, I don't really write about this book, but, um, I took a, like a trip out West and I write about that in the end in my book. And then at, when I got home from my trip out West, I started to write about my story. I was like, Oh, I want to write a book. You know what I mean? But in my book, I was just going to talk about, you know, how I struggled in high school and things like that. I wasn't going to talk about my home life. Cause I didn't think anything was really that bad you know what i mean and then once i started writing it on paper like how we were raised and what happened to us and i was like it was like a huge like not an epiphany but i was like oh my god this is what happened to us and i didn't realize until i like writing it down and like putting pen to paper and that's one of the first things like i can't believe this happening and i didn't get angry about it but i was it was like an enlightening moment it was like oh now i know what happened to me now i can do something about it now i can move forward now like it gave me like reasons on why, why I acted the way I did and why, like, cause I was kind of blaming myself and beating myself up. Like, why did you all this? Like, and, and I'm not trying to play the victim, but like, there was a reason why all this happened. And now I knew why, and now I could do something about it and why, what, how I felt and how, why I was having, you know, difficulty with relationships, things like that. And that's when I really started to forgive myself, start to forgive everybody else. Once I put pen to paper and that was a big moment. Um, for me. And then, so that's why I put a lot of the stuff about, you know, to be in my book. Like I wasn't even planning on doing that at all. Mm. Like I was just going to talk about my journey and things yeah. like that. And so that was a huge moment for me when I did that. And then from that moment, when I start, when I realized that that's when I started to forgive myself, started to work on myself, started to forgive others. So mm -hmm. I think that's kind of like an answer to the question. Well, and you, in part of that, that journey and facing all of that, um, you, you did have, sit down and have a conversation with your mother too, and maybe other people in your life, which must have been very difficult. I did. And so, and I think this is pretty important. And this is why it was so difficult. And it still is today. My mom is still with this man today. Yeah. You know what I mean? And she, and so, yeah, our relationship is somewhat strained because of it. I still talk to my mom, you know, it was, you know, I still text her, I tell her I love her, things like that, you know, but it is still strained because she's still with this man. And so, and I told her, like, you know, I, you know, don't call him dad anymore to me, you know what I mean? Things yeah. like that. And so I did sit down with my mom and I told her like, you know, what happened and what I, what I was thinking and, you know, I was going to put this book out and then, you know, she just focused on, oh, you know, you did have some good parts in child, like grasping on straws of the good things. Like, yeah. oh, there was good parts, right? It wasn't all bad, you know what I mean? And just like, my mom just wanted to pretend that everything's okay. Like we have a great, happy family, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's just, she's so worried about what other people think. And, and I'm sure, you know, my mom's been through her own 
own trauma, I'm sure, to be able to, you know, reasons why she's staying with this man. And so she's just pretending that everything's okay. And so it's easier for her to pretend that this isn't going on. So she won't bring it up. She won't talk about it and things like that. But I had, yeah. for me, I had to tell her like, this is what's going on. This is how I feel and this. Time. And that's a very difficult conversation to have. And I don't regret having it, but obviously it changed our relationship because I refused to have that relationship that she wanted to have where I was pretending that, you know, cause she was calling him my father all the way up until like 2000, like 17, 2018, you know what I mean? Until like, even yeah. like uh, I'm an adult and like it was, it was insane. It was crazy. And so not until I had that conversation with her and sat her down and like what was going on, what was happening, what I was thinking. Um, yeah, it was just a pretty big moment. It's pretty difficult. And I thought that, you know, everything was going to be, you know, everything would start healing after that, but she just kind of shunned away. And I just went on this journey of healing and like, it would just kind of separate us from there because you know, I wanted to feel better. I wanted to feel good. And it's wanted to keep moving forward. And she just wanted to keep pretending and just rationalizing, no, it wasn't so yeah. bad. And so mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question. So that was a very difficult thing to sit down and tell my mom that yes, yeah, but I had to do it. I had to do it for myself to heal. So, yeah. And you, yeah, you, you very intentionally, um, said the things out loud that weren't said, closed a chapter, opened a new one. And your mom was still in that chapter. You know, right. she was in the old chapter and that's her, her reality and she has to live it and justify it. And she has, I'm sure, a lot of reasons for, for where she is as well. Um, right. Were you, because you weren't planning to include that in the book originally and then you, you came to the, you know, the realization it was a really important part to share, were you nervous about putting it in there for maybe people who knew you well that would be upset or maybe... Um, you know, the feelings that, that you too wanted to hide some of this and now you were putting it out there for the whole world with your name on it? A thousand percent. So I was so scared. And so I'm still scared today. You know what I mean? But so a couple things about that. So one is I'm glad I did it, but I'm still scared today because what people are think, obviously. And so I, I don't care what people are think. I mean, obviously you do. I say that, but like, you know, I'm still worried, you know, yeah. So with that being said, obviously it's a lot to put out there and put that out there and also putting, you know, my family out there and things like that. But what I had to come back to is like, I couldn't keep pretending that this didn't happen to me. You know yeah. what I mean? And so I'm the big belief, like you have to shine a light on the darkness. So it just can't have this power over you anymore. This thing had so much power over me. I was so just, yeah. It was like eating me up inside, you know what I mean? So I just had to let this out. I had to, it was like freeing me. If you shine the light on the darkness, it just can't hurt you as much. And so and the way I had to deal with it, I had to put this book out. Like I had I had to write it and I had to share it. And so hopefully, and a big reason why I did it, obviously it was for me, but it was also, I'm sure other people are going through this too, you know, something similar. And so, yeah, it's very scary to put this out there and you're going to be fear every day, but I know it's the right thing to do. And if people are going to judge me or not like me because of what I've been through or what I like, those are people I don't want to associate with anyhow. It yeah. doesn't matter. I don't think those people would have liked me anyhow, even if I was hiding all of it. Why do you want to hide your whole life anyhow? And people say, well, why do you put your drama out there? If it's not for you, you don't have to listen to it. But there's are people that do want to listen to it because yeah. I wanted to heal. And why do we have to pretend that these things aren't going on or these things didn't happen? I was so sick of that it was eating me up inside. And so that's why I was, it was just kind of like a release. It was kind of like a, you know, a pressure valve and they just push, push it, you know, letting it all out there and just, um, putting it out, out in this world. So yeah. that's a big thing. But yes, I was scared to death of putting it out there. And so like it, and, but my friends have all been so, my good friends have all been so supportive of me. You know what I mean? They're still obviously my friends. And then not only that, I told some of my friends or people that I know, and it was like, you know what, that happened to me too, mm -hmm. you know, or something similar. And so it just kind of bonds us and made some bonds stronger. And mm -hmm. so it was a good thing that I did it. But of course I was scared. Of course, I'm still scared every day, but I know it's the right thing to do. And I just have to have a belief in myself that, you know, I'm shining light on this darkness. Yeah, which is... Um... I mean, it's meaningful in so many ways to so many people. For you, it's, you know, if, if I can use the word, it's it's almost cathartic, right? You've, you've kind of released that pressure valve and you've put it out there. Being true to your story so far, you have the perspective that if people don't accept you because of the book, those aren't the people that you want in your life. So you're continuing to almost force yourself to have the right people, the right influences, the right perspective around you. It's sort of what you've done throughout your education and your professional career and even your running where you push yourself beyond what you thought 
maybe you were going to do what you were what might have been possible for you right and you've just kind of what's on the other side of that what if i just get to the other side how does that feel what can i accomplish um so yeah i think it's it's pretty incredible yeah thanks it's it's very courageous it's not something easy to do but you talk about liberation we uh, for the benefit of our audience i can we can see you on video you just look like a man who's released it all you know you've just you've just given it all out and you've got that loose feeling about you and it's like free with space and and you know you can't really pick that up sometimes from audio but certainly from the the call today the video chat i can see it you you you, you have that energy of somebody that has maybe not revealed or released all his burdens but definitely a significant amount of it and and right and 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 so we're all doing that to some degree we all carry tension we all carry past we all carry trauma and and I just want to say I think that's tremendously courageous and I think your friends that have supported you must be incredibly proud of you and that leads me on to the question for you what what are you most proud of in your life uh that's a great question that I'm just most proud of that I didn't let what happened to me get the best of me, Mm -hmm. that I just kept on going. Because there were times where in my life where like, I wasn't going to write this book and not that I still would have had a good life if I didn't write this book, but that I just kept pushing myself to want the best for myself. That's what I'm most proud of, that I just never gave up on that that aspect because I think a lot of people in this world it's just so easy to just stay with the status quo like oh my life is pretty because my life was pretty good and it is still is pretty good but I didn't have to put this book out there that's what I'm most proud of that this thing inside me just never went away that I wanted to keep going and keep pushing forward so like it's a it's I say it's a curse and you know it's it's something great but because I could just you know be laying on the couch just relaxing doing nothing but instead i choose to do this and so it makes me feel good about myself that what i'm doing and then it it keeps me pushing forward and just wanting to be better so i'm glad i'm very proud of myself that i always want to keep doing better amazing that's amazing Um, yeah we're very proud here at audio life as well to have you on as a guest and, and and share this so so thank you for that kyle Sure. And also, I think we were talking about just, you know, how you're afraid of, of fear. And I didn't talk about, I talked about this a little bit before, but about how I passed the bar exam, there's somewhat of a story there. So, hmm. and what I want to talk about that is just because, you know, fear isn't as bad as you think it is going to be. So to pass the bar exam, you have to, you have to, in New York, you have to take this thing called the character and fitness exam, where you have to like turn in all your, everything you've done bad, all your arrest records. They take this big, huge, you know, fingerprints and they do like a background check on you. And I thought I was never going to pass this. I thought, cause I was, uh, you know, obviously my past when I was a kid and we didn't get into this, I was, you know, I got arrested for assault, you know, underage drinking, hit and skip, all kinds of things. And I, even as a kid, you have to turn this into the bar and tell them everything you did. So in New York one day, I, I was like, you know what, I don't know if I want to go through this and just be kicked out, you know, not know the fact that I would not be able to become an attorney, but you know, something inside me kept going. So I flew back home to Ohio with all the police stations, got all my arrest records Hmm. and came back and I turned them into the New York bar. And in order to pass the New York bar, you have to uh, get interviewed by uh, some like uh, a member of the bar, like an, uh, an attorney or a prosecutor, something like that. And so as I went in there to get my interview, there's a bunch of kids getting their interview as well. I just sat there waiting, waiting, waiting. The kids were going by and I sat there for two hours. Then somebody came in, they brought a special prosecutor in there to question me. And I was like, oh no, I'm never going to be able to pass this. And this press or prosecutor got my file out and there's this big thick file with all these markings out of it, you know, all these red tabs. And I was like, oh no, you know, here we go. And so they call me into this room and I sit down with a special prosecutor they brought in for me after hours of waiting and I'm terrified. I was like, oh, I went through all of these years of law school. And before this, I had panic attacks all the time. I was so scared. You know, what am I doing all this for? And so I sat down and they started going through my file, I started looking through my file. I was like, you have quite the record here. It's like, yeah. I was like, oh no, what are they going to talk about? Are they going to talk about my drugs? They're going to talk about you know, my fighting and things like that. And this woman pulled out this piece of paper. I guess it was the most recent thing. I got a speeding ticket in law school and she starts asking me about this speeding ticket. I'm thinking, what is going on here? She goes, well, how do I know you're not going to do this anymore? And I go, well, I don't have a car in New York, so it's impossible for me to get a speeding ticket. She was like, oh, okay. And then she just kept, kept going through my record. She goes, well, are you going to be a good attorney? I go, yeah. And she, that was it. 
a stamp. I was an attorney. So I was so terrified of like anything. And the only thing she's asking me about is a speeding ticket. And then, and it was just like, it was such a relief. And that was it. I was a, you know, I was a licensed New York attorney. And so it's just, it just goes in your head. You build something up in your head. You're so terrified of something that is, it's going to happen. And it's just, it was nothing. It was absolutely nothing. And it's just, it was just amazing. It was an amazing feeling. So I just can't highlight it enough because in my head, I thought it was going to, I thought I was going to die. And it was just like, I built this up so much and it was just, it was nothing. And it was just an amazing feeling that, that I actually, you know, was to be able to become a member of the bar, but this fear was nothing. And I made it out to be something. Right. And for years as well, building and building and building up to this moment, not sure that even if I graduate from law school, am I going to be approved, you know, with this character and fitness test and it all to accumulate right. into this moment. And eventually just to be asked, um, what about the speeding ticket? Are you going to be a good lawyer? Yeah, <laughs> that's it done. It was yeah. totally nothing in the end. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. So it's crazy. Yeah. And I've sat there in law school, like studying, like, why am I doing this? I can't be a lawyer. Cause I always knew about the character and fitness exam. So I thought it was just, it was just, I was in fear a lot of time and you know, living in fear is just not a good way to live. That's how I grew up. Yeah. And then a lot of law school. And that's another reason why I put out this book too. I get just sick of living in fear and just scared of everything and just what's going on. Just put it out there and just, you know, just liberate yourself and just heal. So I don't know. That was a big part of it too. It's incredible. And I think um, that story emphasizes again that your your past does not predict your future. I also want to reiterate again that it, it really is brave to, it's, it's in the face of that fear that you're sharing your story, especially when there are parts that have been incredibly challenging or confusing. And in your book, you mentioned there are, are parts that carry shame with them as well. Um, there are things that you look back and you would have, you know, you wouldn't change your past, but you would have done it differently if you could do it again. But you've continued with that spark that drives you. You've, you've stepped out as a role model to others. People may relate to you. They might learn from you. They might see a path that they can follow that they didn't know was possible for them. And, you know, as we, as we start to wrap our conversation for today, is there anything else that you wanted to share that we haven't asked you about? Not specifically. I'm just so lucky that I found my tribe. And like I highlighted this before, just finding the right people to hang out with and yeah. just trying to spend your time with, it's just going to dictate your life so much and what you're going to be capable of. And also in the inverse, what you're not going to be capable of. So that's what I, that's just the big message, just hanging around the right people. And like, if you cannot find the right people, they do exist. You just find them in the books and the, or in podcasts. Yes. And the best thing about it is you don't have to ask them. You, they just have to be your mentors. They have to be your friends and they can, you know, push you to do better. So yeah. I just can't highlight that enough and just, you know, believe in yourself and just, you need to have that support with those other people believing in you too. And there are people that believe in you, even if you don't hear them, even if you don't have like the Mr. Brady that I had or the David that I had, there's people out there that do believe in you and just haven't heard it from them. But I'm telling you, I believe in you. You know, if there's other people that believe in you, I promise you that you just got to believe in yourself and know that there are other people that have your back. Yeah, 100%. I believe that's true as well. Kyle, it's been incredible to, to have you, you know, your inspiring guest. We want to thank you from everybody here at the Audio Life Podcast. It's been enriching for others to be able to learn from you, relate to you, see different pathways to living life and finding success. You know, it's very much an underdog story. Um, and like how you were able to persevere and persist with that is truly inspiring. And for those closest to us, these memories and stories are going to be cherished for a long, long time. So thank you again for coming on the podcast, Kyle. Thanks for having me, Gafor. Thanks for having me, Carrie. I really do appreciate it. Oh, it's been our pleasure. Well, you've been listening to the Audio Life Podcasts. We've been your hosts today, Carrie Purcell. And Gafor Masood. If you like what you heard today, don't forget to rate us so others can find us and subscribe. You never miss an episode. You can also see videos from the podcast on our YouTube channel, Audio Life Memoirs. See you next time. If you like what you heard today, consider recording your own Audio Life private podcast or giving one to a loved one for a unique and memorable gift. Today, Audio Life listeners will receive 10% off using discount code GIFT10 and order number Audio Life Podcast. Also, remember to rate our show and subscribe so you'll never miss an episode.